Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media production. And our second hour is usually something uh, we'd like to spend a little bit more time on. And today, we're really excited to have Elias Perunin here. And he is going to be talking about NDI multiviews. What are those and how do they work? He's going to talk about them in the second hour. So stay tuned for that. Uh, if you've got questions uh, for the second hour, thank you for giving me that <laughs> slate back. <laughs> so I was like, what happened to my slate? Um, if you... Um, uh, uh, if you are, uh, uh, if you have questions, of course, for the first hour or second hour, if you're in Makana, go ahead and ask those questions. You can tag the questions, multi-view for NDI, um, and uh, you, or you can tag them as general questions in, in inside of uh, Makana. Uh, make sure to vote on questions. There's a lot of questions. There's always a lot of questions now. Um, and so make sure to vote on those questions so we know what order you'd like to manage those in. So um, vote on those questions in Makana. If you're not in Makana and you're and you're watching this show 24-7, any time of the day, you can ask a question. We had a whole slew of questions come in over the last day because people just thought, well, I got a question. And they don't have to wait. You don't have to wait for the show. You don't have to wait for during the show or before the show or a little after the show. You can do it any time of the day. You can use askofficehours.global or just use that little QR code there. Um, and uh, you can use those there and ask your questions as you'd like, and then we'll feed those into the show. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, what do we have? First one comes from Alan Jones in Vicenza, Italy, says, me starting a YouTube sailing channel and needs guidance to relatively inexpensive mics, wind socks, and gimbals, Zijun plus a gauge perhaps, for the iPhone 14 Pro Max that will perform well in very windy, saltwater, cold environments. He notes the Swell Pro, Pro Pl Splash Zone 4, and he now needs the above. Uh, go ahead, Chris. So, Alan, uh, th there's a lot of things you can do. I think what you should uh, keep in mind, I, I think the number one sailing channel, they've been around for nine years, it's um, Sailing La Vagabond, and it's uh, Riley and Elena. They met in, they're both Australians. They met in Greece. Uh, Riley was flirting with Elena in a bar. I said, hey, why don't you come down and see my sailboat? She didn't believe him for like a week that he actually had a sailboat. Anyway, uh, they have two kids now hugely successful channel go watch the first three months of their channel at least the first five videos they're really bad they're really really bad when you compare them to what they're doing now they're really beautiful but the point is not that you know yes go make a bad video but the point is that the the content is much more important than you know, which camera, which lens, which which uh, gimbal. They got hugely successful because it was a compelling story to watch Elena and Riley live their life and raise their kids. And and so, yes, there's plenty of stuff you can do. And I'll let Mitchell and Courtney talk about that. But, but it's a super fascinating thing to look at their earliest stuff and then their current stuff and see how successful they got making bad videos. Go ahead, Mitchell. Alan, I enjoy watching a, a show on the Discovery Network. You may get it in Italy. It's called uh, 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 Dangerous. Uh, what's it? Dangerous fishing. The uh, whatever the, the the crab fisher thing. Uh, Deadly catch. catch. That's it. I'm sorry, COVID. Anyhow, um, they've been doing it for like 15 seasons, and you see the cameras they're using to shoot in a in the Bering Sea, which is extremely challenging environment uh, to uh, take cameras and microphones and such. I like your idea of going with inexpensive because the first time you drop one of those cameras into the water, um, you're going to cry a little less uh, than crying a little more if it's an expensive uh, Sony or uh, Airy cam. So keep it uh, inexpensive. Try to uh, weatherproof it as best you can and uh, read up on what other people are doing, especially the guys over at Deadliest Catch because they've been at it for a long time. I'm sure they have some great tips for keeping your uh, equipment safe. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I was looking at the Zune stuff, um, Zune, however they pronounce it, um, and it's pretty cheap. And I would not spend a lot of money, like I, like Mitch said, because uh, salt water is the worst thing for any type of electronic parts, and it's going to get corroded and die pretty soon anyway. So you probably want to uh, invest in more multiple copies of something than uh, a higher quality. The only thing that worries me about this uh, this gimbal is it seems to have these magnetically attached lights i'd worry about those things popping off and uh falling into the drink 
Uh, I'd like something that's attached more securely to that uh, to the gimbal mount. But other than that, it looks like a, a good choice as far as a stabilizer for your phone. Your phone will, of course, have the weatherproofness. It's the gimbal that's going to bear the brunt of the salt water problem. I go, Bill. I'm going to play off what Chris said. I would keep it as simple as possible for the beginning. First off, iPhones are relatively well, I, uh, what's the waterproof, IP certified. They don't really have a lot of openings on them. So I, I would definitely use some sort of cage because mounting points would be critical. You're going to be rocking and rolling on the water, so you want to make sure you don't drop it overboard. But I would start out as simple as possible. I think your biggest challenge is going to be audio. Uh, not just on the mic, and I would try to go with maybe a clip-on, one of the ones now they have that are inexpensive that records to the clip-on itself and also sends a wireless signal back to the phone. Uh, if you can do something like that and get multiples of everything and try that for the first few months rather than building out a big rig, which I think is going to be a nightmare. I mean, you're going to be holding it and the boat's going to yaw and you're going to smash it against something and you're going to be constantly chasing equipment for a while. So I'd keep it as simple as possible for the beginning. Yeah. And for, as far as stabilizers go, I would love the, the D the DJI, you know, Osmo for the phone. I find it repugnant that you have to sign in to an app to use it. Um, I just drives me crazy, but it is the best one. <laughs> like, like that's the problem. They have us because it's the best one, but Benro and a lot of other people you had, you had a list there. There's a lot of other people that make quality versions of this so you can look at those but it is the the best one is the is the is the osmo as far as the number of controls and the stability and everything else so anyway that's something to think about but there but I, on a ship i will say that the gimbal is probably pretty useful for you next question John Wallace is up next from an undisclosed office hours data center. That's a scary location. The Kimura headset mic combo looks like a great option for comms for an event. It'll work with custom in-ear monitors, which is great for long-term wear comfort. The mic sounds okay from the demos on YouTube. What does everybody think? And that's a QR code drop question. Yeah, I just saw I oh, it looks so good. Like I, I I'm trying not to. I'm saving it as a, I might come back to this. I'm not ready to buy it yet. I'm hoping that somebody, will, I'm hoping John will buy it. <laughs> I cannot believe it took so long for us to get to a point where someone made this. So there's a higher, higher end one. So a DPA makes a really high end one that goes in ear, either both ears, or they make a version that goes in both ears and a version that goes in one ear that comes down with a DPA mic. That's like super high end. Um, this one looks like it may, if the mic is good, this solves something that a lot of us have been trying to figure out for a very long time, even just for joining shows um, when you're on the road of having one in-ear and built into that in-ear is a mic, is a boom mic that comes down. And we have been talking about the need for this for 10 years at least of like, why doesn't someone just build one of these? Well, it turn, turns out they did. <laughs> so uh, so hopefully we can get a hold of one of those and uh, someone will start, will start testing it. But it looks... Uh, fantastic. Um, and I may get one, at least test it. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Do my Amazon thing. <laughs> so, so anyway, so we'll, uh, uh, see if, see if, uh, it works. Um, so stand by uh, that looks really, really, really good. Um, it just depends on the quality of the mic and how good it is. So we'll see if we can't get a hold of one. I, I, I don't know what it plugs into. That's the one thing that kind of wor worried me is it's wired, but it doesn't say I'm, I'm assuming that it's a TRRS, uh, connection. Now, what I use for this, by the way, is the, uh, shocks open com. And the reason I use that is because it's bone induction. Oh, I think I have one laying around here. So this is the, um, I've got two of them laying around here. Uh, cause I use these all day for my, for my, when I'm on calls, the reason for it is off the, the, uh, environment rejection is very good. It's got a mic on the outside that does a really good job of like identifying what's not me and, uh, taking that out. And so, um, uh, so this is a, um, uh, anyway, so this, this works well because I can have the program in my ears and I can still hear comms because it's bone induction. It's kind of weird because you're getting both comms and the program at the same time. Um, but but it, I, that's why I use the bone induction for that. Um, thank you to uh, Tom Ferguson. And JJ. <laughs> All right. I was waiting. I got to pause for a second so that JJ can be mad for just for a second. But only for a second. <laughs> he was trying to get me to do it for a long time. Uh, anyway, next question. 
Andy Kokendorfer in VR Florida is up next. Thoughts on switching out multiple monitors for a single ultra-wide curved monitor. And he notes he uses his setup for live remote production. Go ahead, Elias. I've thought about this. I have not yet pulled the trigger on doing it. I personally like having more pixels on my screen than fewer. I find with a lot of the ultra wides, I don't know what you're looking at specifically, but I found last time I did my research, I would get fewer pixels overall with a ultra wide versus having a couple of 4K monitors. That's my personal setup. I like having more pixels, uh, but that, that would be the trade off is do you want do you need more pixels on your screen? What are you trying to do? I like the ultra wide for doing like video editing, post-production stuff. I like having separate monitors for my live production. Go Jason. With Elias, for the most part, ultra wide monitors sacrifice vertical resolution. And to me, vertical resolution matters more than horizontal. Plus I like to be able to snap my, my, um, my apps into specific places in a desktop. So as a rule, I would rather have, you know, even if it's the same number of pixels, two things that I can actually like square or rectangle up than try to like get everything into this big nebulous space. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I agree with uh, both comments uh, prior to this is that I, it looks interesting, it's cool. Um, the problem is I'm worried about if I'm editing or creating content, uh, like you say, squirrel, uh, squirrels, uh, squares or circles, uh, that you're going to have a little problem with them being a little oblong or out of geometry. So uh, I'm going to go with uh, standard monitors uh, next to each other, too, as opposed to a big curved monstrosity. I go ahead, Chris. I think if you want to ensure that you get reflections and hot spots in your monitors, the best way is to curve it. That way you'll be certain that you'll get at least one hot spot or reflection. Yes. Bill. Yeah, that geometry really does make sense. And uh, depending on the lighting control you have behind you, it can be a big deal. I will note that I just got back from that road trip to Cupertino. And so I took only my MacBook Air 14 inch. And I have a larger IPS monitor that I usually use as a second screen with it. I actually left that at home and took one of the smaller ones that I use here at my desk every day because more screens that are smaller seem to be a better solution for doing something complex on the road. So if it's always going to be at your desk or you're going to go set up a workstation like at a remote event or something like that, I think a larger curve monitor could work for you. But I prefer actually more smaller screens because I like to have the individual breakout of what's where. Gordon, Courtney? I hate curve monitors with the passion because of the reflection problem, which was mentioned by several other people. That Yeah, if you have any kind of lights or windows Great behind times. you, Every time you move your head, the reflection is going to move in the opposite direction than you expect it, and that throws your balance off. Uh, it makes me nuts. And uh, with individual monitors arranged in the same, you can tilt one down if it has a reflection of a window over there, and you can tilt the other one up a little bit to get rid of the reflection back there. But with a, a single curved monitor, you can't get rid of the reflections, and they move in the wrong direction because of the real type reflection instead of a mirror type reflection in a concave surface. Yeah, um, one of the things, because I have a matrix, I'm also rerouting uh, stuff all the time. So my monitors aren't stable. So what, what I put on different monitors all depends on it. So as a result, I kind of stick to it. I know this will sound crazy, but I stick to 1080p on all these, all these monitors. I have a bunch of 4K monitors, but I can do 1080p because I just, they're all running through my switcher. Some of them are running through my switcher. Some of them are running into all kinds of other things and to, and to keep them all in the same thing. And a lot of it's driven because I have an extreme and I need to do 1080p into the extreme and a lot of the computers serve that. And as a result, I keep everything at the same resolution. I have a matrix that lets me jump between these. I usually typically, depending on my configuration, have somewhere between six and 10 monitors up so they're you know that and a whole bunch of machine a whole bunch of computers and so uh, the idea of trying to combine all of that into a curved monitor i don't know if that'd be possible for me next question roscoe jones is up next from madison indiana and roscoe says what do you think of shooting projects such as this and he's got a link to a project completely on an iphone as it makes for a small travel kit go ahead elias yeah i've shot entire productions using logitech mevos and the client has been happy so to me, the question is more about would the client, given the kit that you've got, would the client be happy with the outcome? That's the bigger question in my mind. So, yeah, I, if, if you can pull the shoot off with nothing but iPhones, go for it. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Jason. 
Ditto to what Elias said, and I wanted to point out, if you are going to shoot with an iPhone and use external memory, OWC got way ahead of this, and uh, they made an app for the iPhone called OWC Drive Speed, which tells you how many frames you drop based on, you know, what you're plugging in externally, which is a, a clever, clever little addition. Good, Bill. Very nice. I've shot probably 75% of my projects in the last three years only on my iPhone. Occasionally a client will demand a bigger camera, so I'll take one out. But it has been transformative for me. So I, my guess is yes, you have to pay attention to what you're going to need, particularly in the audio input process, which can be the most difficult aspect of doing some traditional EFP, electronic field production kinds of things where you have multiple subjects and you want to make sure you get audio from all of them, ISO'd and things like that. But for most of those projects, it has been transformative. I find it is very freeing just to have an iPhone on a monopod or something like that. It's light. I can get low and high angle shots. I find I shoot more freely if I'm using an iPhone than I do on the big cameras just because it's so agile. So give it a shot. There you go, Courtney. I didn't have a chance to look at your YouTube video, but it depends on the type of project you want to be shooting. If you want to be more clandestine uh, and shoot without, uh, a, you know, do uh, stuff where the subject is not aware that you're shooting them, let's say, um, then you need going to need longer lenses than the iPhone will afford you uh, to get back a little further. You can't achieve that good bokeh of a high-end lens only artificially with the computational bokeh that the iPhone Im Im implies uh, or adds uh, so there's those subjects so if you need to shoot more candid photography without uh, making your subjects become aware that you're shooting them or if they get you know shy on camera etc then it makes a difference uh, use a real camera with a long lens go bill I'm assuming that Chris is showing us now in one of the things, the video he's talking about. And I will notice yes. the one thing that immediately jumped to me was that the white balance is off. And the phone is incredible at that. Um, I have been astonished at how good it is in mixed light circumstances. That computational photography part of the new iPhone system has been really good. So I don't think you'd get that kind of uh, obviously that's lit with oh, that's tungsten. I think it's all this, this is an artistic decision, this orange stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's plenty of, there's plenty of footage that doesn't have the orange glow to it. Well, yeah, the, anyway, it's usually really good with that. I, I, I will say that I reached, I realized, you know, the, the Apple event, which we're going to cover next week. So Tuesday of next week, um, we're going to, we're all going to go through that Apple event frame by frame and try to identify every piece of hardware in the, in the entire thing for the second hour How and really fun. talk about what they are, why they are, why it's important, what it looks like, you know, what, what we're doing. Um, I didn't think it made that much of a difference until I had a client yesterday going, hey, what are the specs of, this is a, a client that does a lot of, you know, bigger things with bigger cameras. Ask, hey, what would it take if we shot this with an iPhone? Like, we're gonna deliver you some footage, what would it take? And I said, well, you know, in this case, we'd really like 4K60, but to do 4K60 in, in Apple ProRes, we want Apple ProRes, 4K60 HQ, you're gonna need to ha you know, put a hard drive on your phone um, to do that or it won't identify, but you could go down to 4K, either 4K 30 or 1080p 60, but we want Apple ProRes HQ so that we can do color grading. And I was like, I cannot believe I'm having this conversation with a client about how to shoot with their phone. You know, like, like you know, like it's like, it's a phone, you know, and, um, but I knew that if they followed any of the instructions that I gave them, I'd have footage that I could actually use, you know, and, and that's the, that's the thing. But, but the fact that someone was asking me 10 days after Apple's announcement tells you why, like that was not a hardware announcement. It was a iPhone commercial that used MacBook Pros as the subject, you know, of it. But that was a, that was a giant iPhone commercial. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. So what do you think the prospect or the possibility of Apple saying, you know what, let's take everything we've learned about putting f cameras into phones and let's just make a professional camera. And not sell it for a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars. Make it a five thousand dollar camera, and oh. and give the, and have the uh, the option of actually doing like real optics and not you know little drops of resin. I just don't think that I, the market is too small for Apple. You know, I remember having a conversation with a manufacturer that that makes cameras, and I said, "Oh, I got this great idea," and it, it, I was trying to get them to make a three sixty camera, and they were like, "Do you think we can sell two thousand? Because we can't turn the switch." 
on if we don't think we can move 2000. And that was a company not nearly as large as Apple. Apple yeah. needs to think about like the reason that they don't, I mean, the reason that they discontinue things is because it didn't sell 10 million a year, like, you know, or, 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 you know, a million a year. And so, yeah. so the camera market's too small. And it's also super congested by people who know what they're doing. I mean, like in the $6,000 range, you have Blackmagic, um, Panasonic, Canon, Sony, you know, all these companies, um, Red, they all live in this and they're doing incredible work. I mean, what you can buy, I mean, you can buy a really good camera for $2,000 or $3,000. You can buy what would have been a film camera, state of the art 10 years ago for $6,000. And now they have, now we're at seeing global shutter being dropped in. We're seeing all these other things. And so, um, so I think that the market is really congested and the numbers that Apple could sell. And I think they'd rather just make it, just keep, have you keep on buying better iPhones, you know, and it's, you know, and, and it's going to be a, the, the other thing you're going to see is, is when Apple releases the vision pro and then the iPhone 15 gets an update and you're suddenly able to shoot stereo, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that want that are going to feel like, well, I don't know if I'll ever use this or not. By the way, if you shoot stereo, you're not committed to stereo. So if you shoot stereo, you'll, you'll have a regular video and then you'll have a stereo version. It's a, it's what we call it. It's an HEVC MV. So it's, it's a one hero eye that has all the data and another eye that they're calculating the Delta. And so, so as a result, you know, you can just start, but I think a lot of iPhone users will start shooting stereo. And what's going to happen is it's going to generate all this content that you can watch on on a vision on a vision um, system uh, that and as the vision keeps on rolling out, it's it's a pretty pretty genius marketing plan. Alex, have you played with that? Have you done stereo on your you iPhone can't. 15 on the two? Not, you, so you can't not, separate two lenses. Yet. They're not they're not there yet. I mean, and it doesn't they, matter they, that the interocular distance is so small. You know, it doesn't. Uh, well, it does so it would be better if they put it on either side of the phone, absolutely. If they put it on the long side or even better on the wide side, you would get a much better interaxial or inter it's an interaxial distance that that is closer to the interocular distance. The issue is, is that, um, uh, that you can with machine learning and everything else get pretty close. So RED came out with a stereo camera, you know, their hydrogen camera, which didn't go anywhere, but I bought, it, bought one, got two. Um, and uh, the, uh, it the stereo on the red stuff was amazing, and they and those were those lenses were the same distance or very similar distance to the to the iPhone one. So hmm, so it can be done. It's just not as good, but way better than mono. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, having seen the video now, Roscoe, I'll I'll amend my uh, suggestion before because I didn't see any people in, in your stuff. If you're shooting architectural or real estate photography, the wider the lens, the better. Yeah. And uh, you can get more dynamic moves by moving that camera fairly swiftly through uh, with a very wide lens. And of course, it makes the rooms look a lot bigger than they really are. So it's great for uh, selling real estate. Yeah, and for and for travel photography as well. I mean, being able to use a phone that can get Apple ProRes and have those lenses and, every, and everything else and not be on a camera camera is a big deal. Like you might do interviews and you might talk about stuff with, with really short depth of field, but being able to go through the streets of Greece or go through the streets of whatever and, and do it with a phone is, is a big deal. Uh, next question. It's our own Chris Fenwick from Half Moon Bay, California. And he says, I figured out why my OBS was not happy yesterday. Can we discuss what I found? What happened, Chris? Uh, I was cocky and arrogant about upgrading everything on the first day. But I thought I thought that's just the way you do it, and it's just you that is the way I the do edge. it. And and I will tell and you, it always that 99 works out for you. Ninety nine percent of the time, it's just fine. Yesterday was bad, so so it it is interesting what happened. Um, it's the sound of shot in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I thought that Alex, was, what was the, the dog are, in the cartoon. Alex, while the adults Lovely. are talking, I sent you a YouTube video. You might want to watch it. Um, so yeah. here's what happened. Uh, as is the case when things don't talk to each other, who's who's changed the language? What happened? Um, Zoom could not see the output of OBS's virtual camera, and. Intermittently throughout the day, it could not see the output of the ATEM virtual camera, which was really weird. Um, but actual webcams, no problem. Built-in webcams to the Mac, no problem. So whose fault is it? Is it Zoom's? Is it OBS? Is it the OS? Well, it turns out it was Apple. And, and it wasn't that Apple broke something. They just changed their requirements for 
what something had to be to be called a virtual webcam. And it was down in the OS. Now, what's interesting is people always say, well, I would never upgrade on the dot, dot zero release. I'm going to wait till at least dot one release of an OS before I upgrade to it. Well, here's the thing. Sonoma 14.0 worked fine. They broke, or they, they didn't break it, they changed their requirements of what a, a virtual camera would be called with 14.1. And what I had uh, um, upgraded to Wednesday night was 14.1.1. So the fix to it, for those who are interested, um, and it's easy to, I found it, so I'm going to say it's easy to find. Apple released a document that said basically you you go into um, recovery mode on your Mac, you, you shut down, you restart holding down Command-R, you go into, um, I don't know, there, you launch the terminal, there's a long string of stuff that you have to type that ends with equals zero on, and then you restart and everything's fine. So that's what's currently happening. I noticed it did crash this morning. I don't know why when I... My mom has become an Office Hours fan. I had to run down the hall and turn on Office Hours for her. Um. Uh, point, point five. That's when I usually uh, upgrade. Point four, point five is kind of my like. Um, I let them ring out the, the uh, let, let them ring the system out before I before I start jumping. And part of it is to exactly your point. I want Apple to get. I want it to give time to the developers to fix their things. It's not just Apple. Right. And let's be clear. Like Apple didn't just do this without telling anyone. Um, if you watch a lot of the WWC stuff, you'll see Apple will tell people what they need to do years in advance, like years. They very, very rarely, unless there's a security issue, do they do something that you didn't expect. Um, they, you know, they generally, they're talking about the need to handle certain protocols a certain way, but they are hardened and they will just turn the switch when it's, when, you know, they'll say, this is coming, this is coming. They can't tell you when, but they're like, this is coming soon, this is coming soon. When, when we saw some of the move to metal and some of the other things, they were like, and suddenly everything broke, you know, and, uh, and suddenly then all of these manufacturers who were dragging their feet, I mean, they've got, to be fair, everybody's got a lot of things they got to deal with. There's a lot of priorities and they don't make that a priority until people are calling and saying, Hey, what's going on? You know? And so, so that, so what happens is, is Apple has to, at some point, just move the switch over and say, you're going to have to sort this out. And Apple, I will say does this a lot faster than, does this a lot more frequently than other operating systems uh, because they just keep moving forward. They're like, we're not, we'll give you a little time, but we're not going to wait for you for too long. Yeah, go ahead, Elias. Yeah, that's that's in stark contrast to Microsoft. They have shims in there still for Arthur's teacher trouble from 1993, so it'll still play nice on Windows 11. <laughs> yeah. But Apple, I mean, Apple is good. The The issue I have as a software developer is, Apple doesn't always make it easy to verify that your software is compliant with their new security requirements or with their new OS. And you can also get into a scenario where you can fix your software to run on the newest Macs, but it's now broken on the old ones. And the, and the answer to the customer is, oh, you have to upgrade your OS. And for those of us in production environments that it's like we've got, you know, we're locked down on a specific OS version because we know it works all the time that might not be an option. So my my issue with Apple is that they is they don't make it easy for the developers to verify that everything isn't just going to magically break. And when it comes to some of their security stuff, their answer is, oh, you found our security. This is undocumented and we're not going to give you any details thread locked because otherwise, you know, zero day hackers would have a field day with this. Well, and the, and the other thing though, is that, that also, um, that if you keep up with Apple, you know, like if you if you if you drink the Kool Aid and you keep up with Apple on all the things that they're asking you to do with with frameworks and so on and so forth, usually these are minor adjustments. If you fall behind, is when you get yourself in trouble most of the time. You know, like usually it's like a little thing that you have to deal with here and there. But and again, you're trying to do something across platform. You're trying to do you know, like there's a lot of reasons developers don't do that. But Apple just says, well, we're just going to keep moving forward, <laughs> like you know, like you know, and and you're going to have to figure it out, um, especially on the Mac OS because the Mac OS is such a. I mean, here's the hard hard truth is if you look at all of uh, six, six colors. By the way, um, is uh, is is Jason Snell's website, and he does these incredible graphs about the the quarterlies. And when you look at that, you have to look at the little sliver that is the Mac OS. You know, Apple wants this thing to move forward. They want to keep moving forward. It doesn't affect their bottom line. <laughs> like, like it doesn't, you know, the Google Google paying for a search 
is way more money than selling all the Macs they sell every year. So, so it's you know you just have to look at those slivers and realize they're just going to keep moving forward because they don't care. Like I don't mean they don't care; they care, but they don't. It's not like suddenly everyone's going to stop. If they if people slowed down ten percent of of stopping to buy Macs, they you know for a, for a month it wouldn't affect Apple. Like you know in any in any significant way. So that's the that's the hard part of it is they just they just want to keep it and they so that allows them to have the freedom to just kind of go well we're just going to keep moving forward and you guys will catch up so next question i'm still thinking about arthur's teacher's trouble uh roscoe <laughs> jones met us in indiana it's great great early game any thoughts on how the return uh to film production will go with the strike ending in hollywood red is using it as a marketing moment boy are they ever that's fascinating and he's got a link there good courtney I worked on the commercials for Authors Teacher Moment. So really, it was <laughs> yeah. cute. Yeah, in the eighties or nineties. Spectacle, dude. Uh, as far as going back to work and their sale, uh, Red is offering you know ten percent off on Komodos, fifty percent off on Komodos and Komodo X packs, and that's not a great reduction <laughs> considering the prices of those cameras. And I think you know when I'm faced with a period of downtime where there's no work, that's when I buy equipment. I buy new stuff whenever uh, there's no work to do. When there's work to do, I'm too busy to buy and implement new stuff and learn it if it's very busy. Uh, the time they should have put this sale on was at the beginning of the strike because that's when a lot of people buy new hardware and can teach themselves or learn learn how to use their new hardware in the downtime. Right now, supposedly, it's getting so it's going to get so busy to try and catch up with the production schedules and now that both strikes are over uh, that um, there's going to be a shortage of people and equipment and studio space and actors to do the stuff. So uh, you don't want to be learning a new piece of hardware in the middle of that rush. So I don't think it's a good time to buy new gear. But they do give you a discount if you want to, you know, if you need a third camera and you, and there's a shortage of them in, Holly, in Hollywood right now. Good, Bill. Good for their PR department, though. They had this ready to go like bing, right? <laughs> you know, they didn't have to. They must have been working on this through the whole pandemic. And then suddenly it's like, you're right. I was a little surprised. It's just 10% off all the big cameras and 15% off the Komodo and X-Packs. So that's pretty high dollar stuff. And I don't think 10 is going to really move mountains. But who knows? They were ready. Yeah, it, it's um the... It's going to take a little time to turn all the pipes back on. So it's probably, they're already starting to shuffle all of the, now that they know, now they have certainty over that the, that they can start shooting again. They're starting to, you know, there's only one Marvel movie next year, I think. Um, and it got pushed. I think Deadpool 3 got pushed to um, uh, later in Ju or July instead of May. And then they then they pushed everything else into 2025. So it's it'll be really interesting to see what ends up surviving for, because a lot of the blockbusters are the ones that would be impacted the most in a lot of ways. So um, so it'll be interesting to see how it how it looks. It's going to be, I don't know if there's more questions about that strike, but it's a really interesting thing. <laughs> like what, what they got and what they didn't get and what's happening next. Uh, next question. Next one comes from Chester Sweeney in Las Vegas, Nevada. And he says, is the education bundle for students on Apple's website, the Logic Final Cut Motion uh, bundle, still ongoing? And if so, where? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Bill. To the best of my knowledge, it still is. I haven't heard them stopping it. It is an incredible deal. And I was talking to somebody uh, who works in that division at one point, and he said, you know, it is available for everybody who's a, an actual teacher in schools and things like that, but also this is extended to homeschooling people and things like that. So literally, you just have to check a box. It is an incredible deal. You get the entire Pro Apps bundle for, I think, one ninety nine or something like that, and it includes... Motion, Final Cut, um, and and three or four other programs. I think Logic, are all very, motion, Logic is in there. Yeah, Final it's cut, an amazing Logic, deal. All those are a part of that pipe. And part, they're yeah. official versions. They're not uh, yeah. crippled in any way. You get the actual stuff, and it's permanent and licenses never forever. Right? Yeah, like they never expire, and, and you can right. use them forever. So if you're ever no, a student, rentals, like I, you know, and and literally, you can go to take a community college course for like one term, and you can buy all these student things. Uh, anyway, yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, last I checked, it's the honor system. Uh, if you report yep. uh, that you are in educational and uh, want to have one, and I don't so think it's, I'm, I don't think that it's a, uh, I don't think there's any like watermarks or any kind of thing that pops up or no, anything. There's else. no difference. Just, it literally is. You just have to, you know, be honest. Don't ruin it for everybody. But but if you're a student, you should absolutely, or a teacher, you should take take advantage of it. Um, I believe that you can find it here. This is a, this is apple.com/education, and if you go down here, uh, you'll see how to buy. 
right here. And so you can get it for your school, for your campus. And I think you'll probably be looking at it here is, um, you know, how to buy your know, computers and everything else at a discount. So I think that this is where, um, I believe this is where they'll have the software there to, um, to buy it. You should check it out. By the way, if you are an educator, Apple does educator sessions and they are really good. <laughs> like I take the keynote ones because I've been using keynote since version one and every single session that, that I sit in for keynote, there's a moment where I go, what <laughs> you can do what you know and so so it's it's worth it um, so check check those out oh, i found the page well. in apple.com uh let's see let me kick to it so you'll find this page five five amazing apps and then if you hit the buy there it is whoops come on up deal uh 199 yeah so it's right there it's the best deal in the industry like to to be able to build content for education it is incredible uh next question Next question comes to us from Mark Sanderson at Chesterfield, UK. Good to see Nigel uses the Roland VC, UC V02. Has he used the free switcher software that comes with it? But Roland does not seem to advertise. It lets you connect to an iPad as at the HDMI source and connect up the four mobile phones as video sources. Well, we don't have Nigel here today. I'm, I'm going to cancel this one. Oh, go ahead, Bill. Well, I just, I, I, they mentioned it, and somebody in my back channel uh, said, have you, did you take advantage of that? And I missed it. That, that incredible deal, it was 50% off. So it's normally a $300 uh, piece of hardware. It was 150 just for yesterday. Sadly, I missed it. Uh, but it looks really interesting. If you're traveling and just need to do something from a hotel room or something like that, it looks like a real, that UC VO2 looks really good. The one thing that held me back a little is that the USB port on the back is a USB device port. It's that kind of squarish, but you at the top port that we don't see that often anymore. So my guess, ah, good. Somebody's got it up. If you go to the next page, you'll see the back of it. The you back like of it shows old. you. <laughs> yeah, the old USB yeah, you're connections. Like, what's going on? Like, why are yeah. we not? Yeah, I, I, why I do you have to admit. To like the Korg and the Behringer that I got has got a, they, they both have USB minis in them. And you're like, come on, guys, come on. Like, like little, 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 little effort. That may here. be why um, they're selling them off at half price, though. They may be coming out with something with USB-C or something like yeah, that. The same it, thing. Usually when you see half price, you know, make sure that it's exactly what you want and not mostly what you want, because there may be something behind it. I go ahead, Courtney. And I noticed it says in version two, it has new adaptive sound suppression option for improved sound in a challenging environment. So, hey, it, it, they're coming after sound devices. I, I think that <laughs> I, do, assist. I will say that I think sound devices should have licensed noise assist about a year ago. Um, you want, you know, one or two years ago, because I think what's happened is they've created so much pressure. The mistake you make is that you, you, you create so much pressure in the industry that people will try to buy it from you and then they'll just try to make it. You know, like like they'll realize that this is a really valuable thing and I think that they're, they may be getting behind the, the curve on that one. Um, next question. Next one comes to us from Jen Zolson in Sandpoint, Idaho. And Jen says, in Mac OS, can you map MIDI buttons like keyboard shortcuts to shortcuts or other automation? Go, Jason. And that's a QR drop. Um, yeah, Jen, I'm glad you asked. So there's a great article on... Uh, medium QR code at the bottom should bring you here but this is how to turn a spare MIDI device into a sketch shortcut machine but keep in mind you can do this with just about anything it's requiring a native M1 app called MIDI loop but it should also work on Intel and what it lets you do is see each MIDI device in color and map in real time the MIDI thing in uh, the MIDI input impulse to a shortcut and then it simply does the trigger relay. So you're gonna to have to connect a few dots, but as you can see, it works beautifully. And if you've got questions uh, for us, you can go, of course, add them into Makana directly and make sure to vote on those questions. We have a lot of questions here. So help us prioritize them by going into Makana and voting on those. Of course, you can ask questions for the first hour or the second hour, sour, um, second hour. Uh, so uh, you can tag those inside of Makana if you are just watching the show, of course, and you see this little QR code and how you can go to askofficehours.global and ask those questions there and then we'll feed them into the system um, as we go. Uh, and uh, you can ask those any time of the day. So maybe not for today, but you can ask, go ahead and ask them um, and we will feed them into the system as we go. So tomorrow, if you see this at four o'clock in the afternoon or five o'clock or two o'clock or whatever that is, go ahead and ask your question and then we'll put it into the next day. Next question. 
Jack Rupel in Breckenridge, Colorado, has a link to something called the Microtech Cube 60 Pro AC, and he's noting 1 gigabit Wi-Fi, 60 gigahertz, $250, but he notes not good in rain or snow. That's interesting. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, it's not good because it's a microwave link. What it is is uh, one of these little uh, cube things you put on a mast outside your building. If you have a campus or somewhere where you want to share your Wi-Fi or share your local area network between multiple buildings, that's really what it's designed for. So you put one on one building, another on the other. And I'm not sure how far it can go, probably up to a mile or so, as long as it's clear line of sight. But it's that line of sight that's going to get you with the rain or snow. So if you have a heavy downpour, uh, it may interrupt or limit the bandwidth until it stops raining, but it has to be pretty heavy. Heavy snowfall probably will do the same thing. So it's a 60 gigahertz microwave link to broaden your Wi-Fi to multiple buildings. Next question. Another from our QR question drop. This one from Peter Cook in Paris, Kentucky. Any thoughts on using the Korg MIDI controller with the Audio Lab in ATEM software control? Uh, it should work. Like, I, I don't think we've tied that together, but um, there are other ones that have worked well with this, uh, with the uh, ATEM. So uh, we haven't done it yet. Um, I think that we should uh, probably, uh, maybe another lab. But I, don't, I think these labs could get pretty short if we start to understand MIDI. Uh, go ahead, Elias. Just uh, kind of like a follow-up question to that is, could you tie it together by using something like BitFocus Companion? Does that tie into MIDI at all? I bet you it does somehow. Um, I, I bet you could use BitFocus focus command, uh, t commands to do that. There's, I mean, the way we talk to the ATEM, the problem with the ATEM is that a lot of times it's not completely opened. The way we talk to it is using MixEffect Pro. So if you can, if you can get something to talk uh, OSC, um, there's a there's a there's a handler for that that you can then talk to Mix MixEffect, and then you can do anything on the switcher that's there. Um, and and that wasn't done for the API. That was done from wire sharking you know so, you know figuring out exactly what's going on uh, go ahead jason yes you can and you can do it directly if you want a, a good walkthrough friend of the show john barker has um has some excellent videos on this next question robert sababade in poland says anyone had any success using the iso recorder in vmix with ndi feeds and he wonders how much power and bandwidth you need for six channels uh, I don't know if anyone here has tried to do that. I know in the past we've had trouble with ISO records on VMAX, of them not being as stable as we'd like them to be, but it may just be the uh, the computers that we're using. Uh, I don't know exactly what power, but I would I would say a very fast hard drive. I mean, usually the hard drive is what um, becomes problematic on a lot of these records. Go ahead, Elias. Yeah, fast hard drive and lots of memory bandwidth as well, because yeah. the uh, NDI lives generally lives in CPU space or at least the frames are gonna be CPU accessible. So you're gonna to wanna to do fast memory, fast CPU, fast, like your your computer's gotta be beefy. It's yeah. gotta be very beefy to do that many ISO feeds. Next question. Jeff Cohen's up next from Miami Beach, Florida. Thoughts on the new Shure SM7DB mic now with the built-in preamp. No more requisite, prerequisite crowd lifter. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, hopefully it has a better preamp in it than the cloud lifter. It does add some new switches on the back so that you now have a um, you have low low frequency roll off. You also have this high frequency boost uh, looks like over there. You can switch on and off and you can change the amount of gain between uh, plus 15 and plus 28 dB. Uh, or you can bypass it completely if you have enough gain in your preamp. It does require you to plug into uh, uh, phantom power because it's no longer just a dynamic microphone it requires 48 volt phantom i think 48 volt uh so uh, there's some different requirements so just bear that in mind but hopefully there since they built it for the microphone that the preamp is tailored to that microphone and gives you quieter uh amplification without adding too much noise which is what the cloud lifter does it's a noise noise lifter we call it yeah all right go ahead mitchell uh, Courtney's right. I think it's uh, since it's made specifically for a microphone that traditionally has had low output, uh, putting an extra 28 a dB is good, uh, particularly if it's matched to that microphone. You're going to solve your uh, uh, your uh, level uh, problems, but you're not going to solve background. It's still going to lift the background noise just as easily as any other preamp would, but it's more likely a lot less self noise. Uh, that would go along with it. I like that it's uh, it in a complete package all ready to go. Elias? Two quick thoughts. 
One, I've noticed locally on our Kijiji and Craigslist, SM7Bs are showing up like mad now that the 7DB is out. <laughs> so if you want to, you might want to see if, you, if you're looking for a 7B and you've already got a good preamp, now might be the time to go used. The other thought is exactly what, exactly what was just said is if your room is not treated and it sounds like garbage and you've got dogs barking in the background and the landscapers are around with a leaf blower, the SM7DB and the SM7B will be fantastic at show, at replicating how crap your room sounds. <laughs> yeah, and and just as a as a um, as another uh, cloud lifters are something that we all put in our pocket or put in our bag somewhere. And you have it as a backup, and you can fix something quickly if you need it. If it's part of your permanent pipeline, you should rethink your life choices. So, um, you know, so if, you know, so the uh, cloud lifters are not, not appropriate for a permanent uh, install. They are a fix. They are, that's what they were designed to be, not something that you put in all the time. They're just really noisy. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Jack Rupel in Brackenridge, Colorado. I have several USB-C hubs from companies like RSH Tech and Acasis. I think those are like Amazon codes uh, with NVMe drives and needed off the cage and off gimbal power. They work that way for the 15 Pro Max ProRes filming. He's looking for suggestions for a powering hub, and he notes that MagSafe does take power from the gimbal that powers the iPhone. Um, yeah, so I, I will say that I, I think the only thing, I, if you're trying to put something on the gimbal, I guess the question for us is what gimbal are you putting it on? So if you're putting something on something like an RS2 or an RS3, uh, you're going to be fine. You can put all kinds of cable in, in there. Uh, if you are trying to use an Osmo or some of the smaller gimbals, uh, for the iPhone, uh, they're very sensitive to being, to being connected to wires. Anything pulling at it will affect the quality of their gimbal and may have them just dump out. Like where they go, oh, I can't do this. You know, so so you just really have to look at how heavy is your, um, how heavy is the rig that's supporting your iPhone to make that actually happen. So let us know what that is and we'll keep talking about it. Next question. Mac, it looks like Zara Haney, I hope I'm getting that close, in Mansfield, Connecticut, looking for AI video editor tools to speed up and reduce repetitive tasks such as organization, notes and tagging, maybe even performing rough cuts. My work is documentary, training videos, and weddings. He's using Final Cut 10 um, on uh, a 2020 i7 27-inch iMac, and he's open to switching NLEs if that gets him where he wants to go. That's a QR question as well. Yeah, and and so the uh, uh, that's all coming. Like I don't, I think I'll be honest. I think that Apple is probably the last one to do this, but but I think that you're going to see uh, this is a pretty heated competition right now between Adobe and uh, and and Blackmagic, and so there's kind of a you know, a little bit of a cage match there on how they use AI. So I think that you're going to see a lot of upgrades that are specifically related to your needs. Um, and my guess is, is that Blackmagic will probably get to them a little faster than Adobe um, uh, because they just have more focus. Um, but I think that both of them uh, are probably going to play pretty hard in this in this area. Uh, next, oh, go ahead, Lance. I know there's an app called Timebolt. I was looking at it before. It's AI-based. I don't know exactly what it will do, if it will give you a Final Cut Pro project or if it will give you a Blackmagic um, uh, DaVinci project. But it looked kind of interesting. But I feel like if anyone's going to do it right, it will be Apple. Uh, yeah, I just think that Apple has been so not successful in this area. If we if we take Siri as their one strong point of doing AI, it's not been, you know, they're they're so concerned about not getting it wrong that they're not getting anything done. <laughs> you know, like, and so I think that that's going to be that you'll see. You, you, you're right that if they do it right or somewhere they show up with it, it's going to work really well. But I think that you'll see more movement from Blackmagic and Adobe in the next year or two. Um, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Um, I'm continually amazed at what Memories does on the iPhone. Would we not call that AI video editing? Yeah. Yeah, it does do a pretty good job. <laughs> like of, of, of the Memories there. And... Um, yeah, so yeah, that that could be uh, could be another option there. Um, there, you know, I think that, but I think that there's uh, who just bought um, Squadcast? I can't think of the name. Um, I don't know why my brain. I always want to call it. Uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, the the problem that I have is that um, my brain will put things in buckets together that don't belong there. So Descript for some reason Descript 
does a lot of these kinds of things. You might want to look at Descript for some of these these tools. Um, my problem is, is that it, Discord, Descript, and Disrupt are all in the same box in my brain. <laughs> and so every time I try to think of Descript, I can't, I can't get it, I can't get it out. Um, and so the, um, uh, but anyway, Descript will do some of this stuff. Also, Opus AI, Opus.ai is another one that does it. My little complaint about those, it seems like a small thing, but they need to do a like one frame fade out between their cuts. I can hear the as it as they as they gets from one cut to another and it drives me crazy and so so that's the and so the, i and i feel like that's such a small thing to fix is just go to zero like literally in milliseconds and move on okay next question the next one comes from cj covell in downington pennsylvania replacing a damaged tweeter part he's got the oem thing from bowers and wilkins the high-end speaker manufacturer but the speaker is out of warranty should i attempt to replace it myself he asks or should i take it to a repair shop this is from the reader. This is from the X, um, from the QR code. I go ahead, Jason. Okay, CJ, if you're asking this question, it means you don't do a lot of soldering. And if you don't do a lot of soldering, take it to a repair shop. You, do, you don't want to cut your teeth on this kind of thing when um, the stakes are high. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, if you don't know where to hold the soldering iron, then uh, you probably should send it to a repair shop. There's nothing magical inside speakers. If you just unscrew the uh, the tweeter and pull it out, there's going to be a couple of wires attached to it. They may be soldered directly to the lugs, or there may be a some type of a uh, clip on there uh, or attachment. Um, so I would say give it a shot yourself. Again, like uh, Jason just said, if, you, if you're a, a stranger to a soldering iron, don't do it. Go ahead, Bill, real quick. Yeah, real quick. Uh, Bowers and Wilkins high end. I always say, is it easy to get in there? If they put screws that are obvious on the back of that and they want you to open it up, that's okay. If they're, it's really hard to figure out how to open it, don't. <laughs> Next question. Next question comes from Jason Papavalescu, it looks like. London, United Kingdom. I can't seem to be able to control my stereo out of sound deck using the Korg. The rest of the faders are working fine, except the stereo out. Any ideas? Thanks. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, Jason, make sure you only have seven channels because the eighth one is going to be the master. And you have to link the master. Otherwise, the eighth fader is only the left channel channel of the master if you have more than seven channels you won't there won't be a fader left over to control the master uh i'm doing it on mine right now it works fine uh it should i would imagine that's the problem next question john merrill in phoenix arizona anyone with experience with live professor what's good what's bad about it what kind of magic is this <laughs> I've never heard of live professor. Like I was just like, so, so the, uh, so, um, uh, I, I am, I am not familiar with this, uh, with this application, but I'm going to become familiar with it. Um, so this is, um, let's see here. This is, this is what they have. Um, this is a, uh, live professor. Yeah. This is for a live professor is a live oriented plugin host. It's just a plugin host. So I guess it would be kind of like audio hijack in some ways. Um, but it has just, I don't know, like, like, sig um, like I, labs are coming. Uh, it looks really cool. Like, it, I don't know we get, if it's stable. Like, I don't know if, how stable it is or not, but uh, if it's stable, labs are coming. That looks like a really cool uh, app. So, no, we don't have an experience with it. Yes, we're going to get some experience with it. Maybe even get try to get them on the show. But what and it does. it is really cool. cross-platform. It is cross-platform as well. Ooh. Uh, next question. John Merrill in Phoenix. Oh, that's the one we just finished. Uh, it's from Mitchell Hill here on the panel from Wilmington, Delaware. Can we talk fonts, corporate, system, mono, space, so forth? Okay, this is probably a whole second hour, so we'll go pretty quick through this one. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, my thinking was, uh, we were talking at pre-show, the categories of fonts that exist out there, everything from corporate uh, to the different types that used to run on Windows only and on Mac only, um, and the different uh, kind of, yeah, you're right, it's a second hour. Yeah, let's let's... Someone put that in for the second hour thing. I think it'd be great to talk about fonts. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Well, just very quickly, I've worked with art directors a lot of my career in advertising agents, things, things like that. This is one of the deepest subjects you can possibly go in. It should be fun, but somebody who really knows types can, can be very passionate about this, and it's very fun, I think. Just remember that there are sans serif fonts, and then there's just a lot of stuff no one wants to read anymore. All right, next question. <laughs> 
The next one comes from Jack Rappel, Breckenridge, Colorado again. Which port on a Mac Studio do I use for the fastest data speeds using powered USB-C hub with SSD and speedy cables? You go, Jason. Yeah, it just depends on which studio you have. So if you go into the system report and then go all the way down to Thunderbolt USB 4, it will show you specifically which one you're plugged into as a rule used back before front. Yeah, and and uh, remember that with the Studio Max, at least, I'm not familiar with, I think the Ultra is all different lanes, but this with the Max, I know, it's two lanes in the back, so it's every other one. So you you gotta if you're if you use if you have if you want the fastest speed, use the first one and the third one, second one and the fourth one, but don't use the first one and the second one. They're both using the same bus. Um, next question. Next one comes from Douglas Carmichael. In an article discussing the PA system upgrade at the San Francisco's Great American Music Hall, they mentioned that they had to engineer rigging points that met strict California requirements. What requirements might those be? Sounds like seismic. Go ahead, Courtney. Anytime you're rigging something as heavy as those speakers above people's heads, uh, there are certain uh, uh, architectural requirements as to anchoring and how how hard they have to be and, and because of seismic. The ground does shift around here occasionally, and horizontal movement can break things loose or cause things to slide off pillars and things. So there are anchor points and safety, safety uh, measures that are taken when mounting anything heavy over the heads of audiences. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I've done some uh, installation design work, and uh, other than the manufacturer's mounting uh, points that they have for rigging the uh, speakers, make sure you have a secondary. It could be something as simple as a wire uh, that uh, protects the speaker. If it falls off, it's going to hang by that uh, safety wire. There are so many requirements when you hang stuff in California. <laughs> like there's, there's like a wire and there's a wire for the wire and then there's a chain and then there's like welding points and then there's like screw points and then there's all the, like, especially if you're doing something permanent in, because California is a, uh, envi- and uh, earthquake rich environment. Um, you know, you, everything is, they're worried about everything shaking all the time. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I don't know exactly what all the requirements are, but I'm, I'm sure that they, it was a pretty uphill process to get those things in. Uh, next question. Mariela Shusha Meira of Weblo, who uh, is worried about Steve Wozniak from Apple, one of the co-founders. Will the Woz be okay? I guess he had a heart attack. Please tell me so. Uh, Courtney? Well, they worried that he had a stroke, and the latest report from TMZ says he may just be suffering from vertigo. And I've had uh, BPPV, or sometimes called rocks in the head which is where little crystals break loose in your semicircular canals and throw your, your vertigo off. And it seems like the room is spinning and you can't stand up. And so if that's the case, it's benign and it can be treated uh, with a fairly simple treatment. And I, when I get it, I can treat myself and recover within a few hours. So hopefully that's what it is. He's in a Mexico hospital still. I think he was speaking in Mexico. He's He's such an inspiring speaker, I have to say. Um, you know, we uh, had him, uh, he was, he spoke at the Silicon Valley video conference that last year. And, you know, he just, there's this thing where he kind of, he's just kind of telling jokes and you you kind of like, is, is, did he really develop the Apple? Like, like, you know, like you just have this feeling as he's kind of talking about stuff, but he gets into things. And one of the things he said, you know, he teaches Imagine he, he for a long time he taught programming at like one of the local high schools just because he loved he loved, he wanted to get kids into it and you know and he he's very effective at it it works really well and and he said the big thing is I just got them excited about it like we just did stuff he goes when kids are excited they'll learn anything <laughs> you know when they're not excited they don't learn anything and it was just like the most it was like but but he, that, that's kind of how he said it he's just kind of like and, and if you you can find I think SVV might have it on their website. Um, but, but he, uh, it's a really inspiring talk. You should, you should watch it. Um, I haven't done that many things, uh, watching him talk. And again, it, it it comes very, uh, unencumbered by a lot of pomp and circumstance. It's just him just talking, but there's a lot of things. He's a really smart guy and he really thinks about things and he's done a lot of great things. And so I would definitely, as we're thinking about Steve and I hope he's fine, uh, or I hope he gets better, but, but, um, I would check out the Silicon Valley video, see if it's on their website. So worth seeing. Uh, we're going to jump into the second hour with Elias Perunin um, next um, and uh, talk about NDI and MultiView. Um, but just a quick reminder, of course, that uh, the weekend is coming and, uh, you know, we do a lot of testing on the weekend. 
Um, uh, we do a little, it's a little different on Sunday. So keep, keep track of the announcements of, of how to get in and how to watch it and so on and so forth. Um, and then also uh, tomorrow we have a panelist meeting. So if you're interested, just a reminder that the panelists, we do have a meeting at nine o'clock AM Pacific Standard Time. And if you're a new panelist or if you sign up for the panelist thing today, you can come too. <laughs> so, so we just talk about, um, you know, the P's and Q's and what we're trying to achieve as panelists. So stay tuned for that over the weekend. Now let's jump into the second hour. Welcome back to the second hour. And we're really excited to have Elias Perun in here to talk about multi-view and NDI, um, something that I know very little about. And so I'm going to let Elias uh, just kind of set the stage, Elias. Um, and tell us before, before we get started, Elias, what do you do? What is your day-to-day -day job? Sure. So day-to-day -day job is doing a live hybrid event production, live streams, that sort of stuff. And the way I've, I both produce events, but I also, I'm a software developer by trade. So I make a lot of my own software to help produce our events, to help streamline some stuff. A lot of our setups revolve around NDI. So we skipped the whole SDI, HDMI route, and we just went full NDI for everything. So we're sending video sources all over the network. How I started to get into NDI was I had a camera that was acting up. And I couldn't figure out why it was acting up. And so as a software developer, I said, okay, I'll just grab the SDK. I'll monkey around with this and see if I can get some details out of it. Started to release those tools publicly. They're available. A bunch of them are available. agfin.gumroad.com. They're free to download. And it turns out that other folks had some of the same challenges. And so I started to release more and more of these tools, incorporate more features based on feedback uh, leading up to the multi-view that I've created today, which solved a problem for a market of one, which was me. What, what's was the, like, what, no, what, what was the problem? The problem was I've, we've got a bunch of PTC cameras on our sites. We've got NDI screen capture running on our different laptops or different video sources. And I want to see them all at the same time, but I also want to be able to control those cameras as well. And not just control pan, tilt, zoom, but also if the cameras have their advanced exposure settings available, which can be adjusted through the NDI SDK, be able to control that and do it all from the same app. And I wanted to do it separate from say vMix or Wirecast or OBS because I want to be able to hand that off to somebody else. I wanna be able to hand that responsibility off to someone else in the chain, whether they're on site, whether they're remote, doesn't matter. I want a camera op that can take care of mixing together, making sure the video feeds are ready and stable and, and good to go. And then I can take that output, put it into my software of choice and, uh, and, and spit that out. The problem I was Very facing, cool. the problem I was oh. facing before was I would have to have a bunch of instances of studio monitor open. So NDI tools comes with studio monitor, lets you preview whatever source you want but I'd have like four or five of these different instances up and it was becoming an alt tab nightmare. If the wrong window was focused, we would control the wrong camera. And there's like, there is nothing worse than controlling the program camera when it zoomed in like 15 X is, is, is the worst feeling in the world. So that's the problem I wanted to solve. And, and, uh, I had a multi view that I made just using bits and pieces internally but it performed once you got more than a few sources in it performed so bad like it it required windows it required like a crazy processor it 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 needed a rewrite and for the features i was getting asked to add like iso recording and multiple outputs and that sort of stuff i was like okay i got to go back to the drawing board and reimplement this and so i spent like a good month rebuilding my multi view and to make it cross platform at the same time so I wanted it to run on Windows. I wanted it to run on Mac. In theory, it can run on Linux. I just haven't gotten that far yet. It should run on Linux at some point. I'm not making any promises though. Elias, for the part of our listeners who don't have deep technical backgrounds, can you explain just overall what NDI is and what it's supposed to accomplish for people? Yeah, for sure. So think of NDI as a way to send your audio and video signals in real time over your standard network cable rather than having to run separate 
SDI cables, control cables, power cables. Like in an idea, in our, I'll give you our usual setup. We have a power over ethernet switch. We plug in all of our pan tilt zoom cameras into that switch, you know, 100, 200, 300 foot ethernet cable. That supplies our power. With NDI, I can send audio, video, and my control signals all over that one wire. And you're, depending on the device, you can get, I think the theoretical lowest latency is a few, a few scan lines. In reality, it's going to be maybe a couple of frames, but there's ways to deal with that. But in, in essence, you can think of it as taking, as replacing your existing copper based workflow where you're running SDI cables and a control cable and power cable and just putting it all through uh, network. And where does it sit in the ecosystem of, we've got that OBS and other kind of relatively new acronyms that people are kind of getting wrapping their heads around. How does NDI sit in the ecosystem like that? When do you use it and when do you look for something else? So I use it, I use it a lot with OBS. So there's a great plugin for OBS called OBS NDI. It's kind of standard issue if you're doing any NDI stuff. Um, I use it to, again, do our mixing for any of our live streams. I have used it for image magnification as well. So we'll do, I'll use OBS to mix all our NDI sources together, spit uh, program feed out to maybe projector and spit program feed out to a live stream. Uh, you can, what's cool about NDI is you can also, depending on your application, for example, I think vMix gives you, I'm way more into the OBS space than I am into vMix, but I'm pretty sure that vMix has the option to send NDI preview and program outputs. So you can actually take, you know, have one operator mixing things together in vMix, send that out over your network as an NDI feed, and then somebody else down the chain can consume it. Um, in fact, actually, when there was a production we were doing, it was for a marathon, a local charity marathon. We had a production site at the start line. We had a production start at uh, site at finish line. And then we had our main production tent. The start line had to be mobile uh, because there were a couple different, because of the different course lengths and that they were certified, the finish line was fixed, but the start lines had to move so that we met the exact certified marathon lengths. The start line, we had a small NDI setup of two cameras, and that was sending, that was then mixed together with, we were using OBS at the start line. It was mixed together with OBS, sent over to our production tent, and that came in as an NDI feed and into my production tent OBS, which I was then able to send out, I was able to ingest that as a source and then send that out to uh, send that out to our live stream and send that out to all of the TVs that were in the park. And all those TVs, they were running studio monitor just in full screen and tuned into the program feed. So as everybody migrates to video over IP from the old tr tradition, this is kind of one of the basic enabling technologies that I think people have to understand in order to play in this zone. Or is do some people use something else? Or is this pretty much the lingua franca of video over IP now? It's I feel like it's becoming the lingua franca. There's also the SMPTE 2110, I believe it's called, which yeah. seems, as, as far as I know, it's I haven't played with that one. It feels like a lot more advanced, it, maybe not more advanced, but it feels like a lot more of a complicated piece of tech. If you, the, where NDI started was really, uh, from what I understand, was it, from the TriCaster world, where they wanted to bring in multiple uh, network sources, just use the network cable as their, as their way to connect new cameras and new sources into TriCaster. And it just kind of took legs from there. And now we're starting to see more devices pop up in the NDI ecosystem. We're seeing, I mean, Mackie's got their, Mackie's got a new mixer out that it gives you NDI audio feeds. We're seeing companies like Llama, they're working on a software-based NDI audio mixer where you can bring in pretty much as many audio sources as you want, mix it all together in pretty close to real time, send that out as an NDI source and adjust that wherever you need to. So cool. it is, it, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty simple to, and it's, and it's simple to work with. Like you can go download oh, the NDI good. tools today and, and go play with it. Courtney has a question here. Courtney. 
Yeah, I was wondering, I, excuse my ignorance, because I've just dipped my toe into the NDI pool every now and then. Uh, what is the bandwidth required? Uh, do you need a, a gigabit? Will a gigabit switch do it for you? Do you need 10 gigabits? And how many 1080p uh, streams, NDI streams, can you send over a single, you know, one gigabit switch? Uh, or does it require higher speed, 2.5 or 10? Sure. So it depends on the flavor of NDI that you're using because there's what I call the full fat NDI, which is, they, they call it high bandwidth NDI, I call it full fat NDI. That is using the speed HQ codec, it's close to, it's still compressed, but not by much. So like a 1080p 60 feed, I believe uses around 100 megabits per second. So, you know, once you get to about eight or nine of those, yeah, you're gonna saturate a gigabit link. However, and then there's the other, I'll get to the workaround around that. There's the other flavor of NDI, which is NDI HX, which is either H.264 or HEVC. And that's going to use a fraction of the bandwidth. Like you're talking, you know, maybe 15 to 30 megabits per second. And that would be pretty generous depending on the source. A lot is I've got some PTZ cameras actually right behind me on the desk that they use NDI HX. And so, but I've, I've got them tailored so that I'm getting, uh, you know, we're, we're running fairly high bit rates for H.264, like 25 megabits per second on each. So can you mix at, the mix the HX and the the fat, the fat version on the same network and with the same uh, multi view that you have? Yeah. So and that's one of the magical parts of working with the NDI SDK and working with NDI in general is anything that is consuming an NDI feed. It does not care if this is an HX feed, doesn't care if it's a full fat feed. It just sees that's a source, I'm getting video frames, I'm going to display them. When I'm working with the SDK itself, programming in the SDK, I don't, I don't care what kind of source it is. I just get video frames in like either, if I request RGB frames, NDI SDK gives me RGB. If I request YUV, it gives me YUV. So, it, you can mix and match all these different types and everything will just work. Perfect. Uh, we have a lot of questions backing up. I know people, you're, you're in such a technical area here that people will have a lot of questions. So Jason, what have we got first up? Well, first off, Robert Zababade in Poland writes in, any recommendations for ISO recording of NDI feeds from Zoom ISO? I use software tools, but needed to upgrade the network to AV class switches at 10 gigabits per second, does it make more sense to use a hardware ISO recorder? Yeah, I would say if you're doing ISO feeds right now, unless you've got a beefy dedicated computer with fast memory, fast hard drives, fast processor, KiloView actually just, I don't know if they just released this, but I, I saw it come across my feed. KiloView makes the Cube R1. It is a standalone NDI ISO feed recorder. And it does, I believe it does nine, it can record up to nine sources. So take a look into that if you're looking for a standalone hardware encoder. I have gotten requests to add ISO recording to my multi-view product. I'm going to look into that, but again, that it seems like it's more of a bandwidth memory and uh, memory and bus bandwidth problem. Uh, but if you're looking for hardware, that Kilo of a cube, I'd look into that. Well, as it seems from what you're saying that whenever you order a new piece of hardware, you just check all the boxes and max it out. Is, is there a minimum level that you're comfortable with? <laughs> you know what? I've got, so I've got a couple older laptops here. Like I've, there's a ThinkPad that's running like a an i5-6300U. And so I use that as my baseline. This is, this is a laptop that just absolutely sucks by 2023 standards. Can we get stuff running on here? And I have to say, my multi-view, I was using it on a production the other day. Uh, I was using it on that specific laptop and it worked fine. For ingesting, yeah, if, if you're just viewing feeds, this is another thing to consider too. If you're just viewing feeds, you can pretty much get away with anything. And if you're getting H.264, HVEC feeds, NDI is going to use as much hardware as is available. So if you've got... GPU, if you've got a discrete GPU in your system, it's going to use that to help speed up decoding. If you don't, yeah, you're going to need a much beefier uh, CPU to keep up. Um, 
in, yeah, you in, noted earlier the CPU is as important as the GPU in this case. Is there a way you'd kind of look at how big those need to be, how much capacity? So NDI again with the with the tools, does it ship with the tools or the SDK? I believe it ships with the SDK, but there are tools, there are NDI tools that are available to test to see what your system can handle. And they are, admittedly, they are synthetic benchmarks, but they will give you an a rough idea of what your system can do. The other thing to think about when it comes to building, figuring out if your system is beefy enough to handle NDI uh, is, are you consuming the full resolution feed or are you consuming the proxy feed or the low bandwidth feed? So almost every NDI device is going to send out two feeds. And the low bandwidth feed is usually like 320 or 640 by 480 or something low like that. And it is meant for situations where you're doing a multi-view or you're previewing all your sources at once so that you're not saturating your network with all of this, with all this extra data. And you're not, if, if there's less pixels for your computer to process, you're just going to take that much less CPU and GPU time decoding and rendering frames. There's a huge, I've noticed there's a huge performance difference in pretty much any tool if you're consuming, if, I mean, my multi-view, for example, if you, if all the feeds you're previewing are the full resolution feeds, it's going to be a slow, painful experience. But if you're just doing the proxy feeds, like it, it'll fly. Fair enough. Uh, I think we're going to the next question. Courtney, did you get want to get into the last one, or, or you I just wanted forward? to ask uh, if uh, if quick if you utilize QuickSync on the Intel chipset, which has been around for five or six years on almost all their chips, which is a hardware based H.264 uh, and HEVC decoder and encoder, uh, which takes the load off the CPU uh, for a lot of stuff. So are are the NDI tools utilizing that if available? That's a good question. I know for NVIDIA they are. Intel, I should go back and test that. They do for, I know for NDI Bridge, they do have a way to show if you've got GPU compatibility. I'm going to fire that up afterwards on one of these. I know one of these laptops has uh, an Intel processor with the quick sync. Yeah. So I'll try that Anything later. Anything from since, you know, the ninth gen on uh, yeah. probably has it on, on the chip. Um, I also noticed, did you have a demo of multi-view? Can we kind of take a look at some of what's happening here? Um, let me see here. Do I have a screen share that's available? I might be, yeah, I, I might be able to rig something up in a little bit. I know that if you go to multiview for NDI.com, if somebody wants to bring that up, um, you might see, and you'll a, talk us through it. That'll you work. Might, you might see a, a screenshot of the office hours folks. Oh, uh, Right. Well, I always like watching ourselves. Anyway, yes, exactly. let's go on to the next question. Tlaloc Lopez Waterman in Galisteo, New Mexico writes in, when developing for NDI, do you have to pay for the libraries or use of the technology? Great question. So there's two SDKs available from NDI. There is the free SDK, which you can go out, you can use, you can make commercial products with it, and there's no royalties. Then there is the advanced SDK. And the advanced SDK is for when you want to get into more nitty gritty features. For example, if you want to send NDI HX, you need to get the advanced SDK. The terms and conditions around payment is from, may vary from vendor to vendor, that part. So full disclosure, my company has an advanced SDK license. The terms of which we have that license are under NDI. I can't talk about those specifics. But what I can say is the specific terms will vary from company to company. Generally speaking, depending on what you're, depending on your commercialization, you may need to either pay royalties or pay a fee for the advanced SDK. The advanced SDK also covers uh, stuff like uh, hardware implementations. So you get a complete reference implementation. Like if you wanted to create a PT, a um, NDI decoder completely in hardware on an FPGA. So this is like embedded stuff. They give you the template for all that stuff. Like they give you the Verilog code. You can go burn that into an FPGA and bam, you've got an, you've got a NDI decoder in hardware. That sort that sort of stuff comes with the advanced SDK. Uh, this multi-view, the multi-view I built just uses the basic SDK stuff. 
Um, I can talk about more programming details if folks are interested as well. Um, cause there's, there's some open source stuff too, that I've, that I released as part of making this, uh, tool, but in general, yeah, if, if you would just want to use the basic SDK, that's free to use. That's one of the great things about office hours. You now have expertise available to you. So if you have any questions about even those high level topics that are very technical, we now have the expertise to answer them. So dive in with your questions. Uh, let's go to the next question from the general pool. Mateus Utila in Helsinki, Finland writes in, Elias, congrats on the NDI MV. What advice or comments about NDI do you have for someone who is already familiar with live streaming but hasn't used NDI yet? Start playing with it. Uh, dive in, download the tools, try sending sources. It's, it's when I started using it for the first time, because like I've been in doing live events and, and live production since my high school days. Like I was an avid member of my AV club, uh, learned so much from that. But I mean, back then when we ran signal paths, it was a unidirectional thing. Like we were either pushing a video feed out somewhere or we were pulling a video feed in from somewhere. The idea that I can just plonk down a laptop, run screen capture or run studio monitor plus screen capture and be able to send and receive video feeds anywhere. Like I'll tell you a story uh, about one area where we did this on a live production. We had a, we were doing a hybrid conference and we had to transform one of, we had the main plenary room and then we had four breakout rooms. But between the plenary sessions and the breakout sessions, that main room got converted into the four breakout rooms via air walls. And the only reason we were able to, and we had 15 minutes to get all that ready. The only reason we were able to do that was because all the cameras we had set up were NDI cameras. So we ingested those onto the laptops that were in the hybrid rooms as NDI sources via the uh, virtual webcam. And then we were able to project onto the projectors using studio monitor. So we were able to change the set, change the configuration of all of our screens, all of our cameras on the fly without having to connect or disconnect any cables. And that was a magical moment for me for NDI. So it, I think for, for someone who is already familiar with live streaming and you might be used to plugging everything in with HDMI or with SDI or whatever you're doing, give NDI a try and try sending your video and audio around as network data and see if it still, and see if it, it works. And chances are, it's, you're probably gonna get some good results. It sounds like you're saying this is incredibly powerful. For the people who ha want to explore it more at kind of a basic level, are there websites or sources or, or anything else that, that you would direct people to to get their feet wet before we go on to the next question? I mean, go to the NDI website, download the tools. The tools are free to use. And there's uh, like some of the easy, some of the low hanging fruit ones is NDI virtual webcam. So being able to set up, being able to take any source from your network or local machine and use that as your webcam on Zoom, vMix, OBS, whatever you want, uh, even in the web browser, just select the NDI virtual webcam. Screen Capture HX, so you can actually do screen capture, send, your, send whatever monitors you want as NDI sources, and Screen Capture HX also supports uh, KVM mode. So you can do virtual keyboard and mouse control using Studio Monitor and Screen Capture HX which opens up a ton of interesting remote control scenarios. We've controlled presenter view PowerPoint from offsite using uh, screen capture and uh, NDI bridge. It's, it's a ton of fun. Sounds like a, it's a perfect basic step in. Let's go to the next question. Jonas Detel in Stuttgart, Germany writes in, thoughts about adding a WIP output to your multi-viewer? Interesting. Adding a WIP output to the multi-viewer. I've thought about different output modes and where to send that NDI output. I was talking with somebody about this the other day. So right now, the multi-viewer that I've got, you can send the actual preview, the, the multi-view output as an NDI source onto your network. So if you've got some piece of software right now that can ingest an NDI source and convert that into a WIP source, I mean, easiest, I think, would be OBS version 30, which I think they added WIP support. Don't quote me on that. I think they did. That feels like the easiest route. 
or if FFmpeg supports it, which I wouldn't be surprised because FFmpeg supports everything. Everything on the planet. <laughs> yes, it is. It, it, it is. FFmpeg is the glue that holds the video planet together. It is. And if nothing else, FFmpeg is embedded, is embedded in the other tool that will do everything on the planet. It's everywhere. Uh, let's go to the next question. Robert Zababidi in Poland writes in, does the multi-view tool pull additional full NDI channel per view? So the way that I've set up the my multi-view is that if you subscribe to a source, if it's being used in any of the multi-view uh, previews, we will only subscribe to that source once. And because what's coming to future versions, it's in there, it's in the core right now, but it's not yet exposed, is having multiple multi-view outputs. So you could have, say, three different multi-view windows open, and they each have different layouts. We are subscribing to that source once, and whichever previews need that uh, need that source to be displayed, we're just copying that frame over. So you could set all 10 of the multi-view sources to be one NDI source, and we're just doing one subscription. Now, whether or not it's the full resolution view is up to you. We provide I provide the capability to subscribe to the proxy feed, the low bandwidth feed, or the full fat feed. It, it depends on what you want to consume. I, we default to doing the low bandwidth feed just because it saves everybody's bacon. And it, I want to take a quick diver, uh, digression into the, into the bandwidth question because this comes up a lot. And this came up on the NDI show we did a while ago um, when we had the NDI panel, which is NDI can consume a lot of bandwidth fast, especially if you're using the, the high bandwidth NDI. But once you're getting into more than a couple sources, more than, say, a, a small test setup, you can get switches that support what's called multicast. You have to set up multicast carefully, otherwise you'll just tear down your entire network. But what it will allow you to do is it will broadcast out those NDI packets only to the computers that want to receive it. But your bandwidth usage is consistent whether you've got one subscriber or a hundred subscribers. That data just gets broadcast out to your network, and instead of you know, it, it, you're just you pay that you pay the cost of of bandwidth usage on the first subscriber, and then all the other subscribers essentially get that data for free. So if you had say uh, four sources and ten viewers tuned into that, if you've got multicast configured on your network you're only gonna be paying the bandwidth of those four sources rather than four times 10, 40 sources worth of bandwidth. Well, that must make things a whole lot easier to handle on the financial side. So it's scalable up without a lot of penalty. Is that what you're saying? It's scalable. Here's, with, with the flexibility comes some complexity once you get beyond a certain scale with your NDI network. And you do have to get into the realm of no, once you get beyond a few sources and if you want to get into more complicated setups and especially if you want to get into multicast, you do need to know what you're doing on the network side. The, the go-to solution for a lot of folks is go out, buy the Netgear uh, M4250 series AV switches. It has profiles for NDI, it has profiles for Dante. You turn those on, everything just works. And those are great solutions. They're, not, they're, they're, they're fantastic. They're purpose built for NDI. You can, as long as the route, as long as the switch you're using supports uh, multicast, IGMP snooping, V3, and a few other protocols, you can make multicast work, but you need to know what you're doing on the IT side. So there, it, it, some IT knowledge does, cre does start to creep in once you get beyond a, once you get beyond a small NDI setup. Well, this is the future. It makes sense. So uh, we're glad you're here telling us about this. Let's go to the next question. Speaking of which, Eduardo Augustine in Panama, PA writes in, what is the network bandwidth requirement for NDI and how much heavy lifting does your network infrastructure do? Sure. Again, depends on how many sources you're using. I use 1080p60 full bandwidth around 100 megabits per second, plus or minus, as a good starting point. NDIHX, I don't know, 10 to 20 megabits per second per uh, source. So if using HX sources, then you've got a lot more room to grow. A lot of the uh, entry level to mid-range cameras that you'll find out there are NDIHX. So 
your bandwidth will not be that much. Your bandwidth should not be that much of a concern. You have to start going quite up level to find cameras that do the full NDI. On the network infrastructure side, I have been on client sites where we plugged our NDI stuff into their network and completely destroyed their network. So is that a problem of the switches just not being able to handle it and things like that, or uh, switches not being able to handle it? And then you've got like we had some weird, we had they they had a weird Wi-Fi setup as well. This particular client, and so we just the combination of NDI plus their setup, we just it, it took down the whole network. So whenever we go on site now, I actually have a rack bag that has our own router, our own switches in it. Like we have our own isolated network and we treat the site's network as our external external internet connection. So we're just using that for internet and we have our own isolated network that we know works. So again, you can, the, the promise is that just plug everything in and it will work. But again, once you get beyond that small experimental setup, you really need to think about what kind of network, what kind of network infrastructure do you have right now and what do you plan on adding to it? Like if, if it's, if your network is already close to saturated, adding NDI is not going to do any favors for it, but neither is going to be adding any kind of intensive streaming, whatever you want. If you were building out again, what hardware would you be looking for, particularly for people who are starting up in this? Sure. Again, if you're doing a small, if you're doing your own small setup and everything's running on your local machine and it's never going out to the local network, then you can use whatever you've got right now. If you're doing just maybe two or three cameras, you might be able to get away with your own network, but I would really think about at very minimum, put that on its own, uh, you know, get a, get a cheapo router, put all those sources on their own router and switch, put them on an isolated network. And if you're thinking about building up and creating a dedicated network, multiple cameras, multiple uh, you know screen share sources, and you want everything to quote unquote just work, then that's when you go into and invest in like the M4250 and the the Pro AV series from from a company like Netgear. That's when you would invest in that and get go larger than you think you'll need because again you. That's going to be, instead of getting the expensive video switcher and all the other equipment, your network is the backplane of everything you're going to do NDI. And so you want to make sure that you invest well in that so that everything will just work. That makes perfect sense. Next question. Steve Uroff in Madison, Wisconsin writes in, what platform is this built on to allow one tool for macOS, Windows, and theoretically Linux? Yay, a programming question. All right, rock on, let's go. So this, my NDI multi-view is built on .NET 7 and C Sharp. So .NET back in uh, a couple years ago was, uh, it's made by Microsoft, but they took it, they open sourced it, and it was rebranded to .NET Core. It runs on, so I can build the software uh, for Windows, for Mac, theoretically Linux, uh, the changes I made for Mac should allow us to run on Linux. I just need to make one or two other changes and, and test things out. So it is built using .NET C Sharp. It is compiled down to a native Macintosh application. So it's like there's there's no weirdness going on. We're not we're not wrapping any you know weird scripting languages. It is it is a native app as far as the Mac is concerned. And same on Windows. And the reason that I went down this way is. There's what glues everything together is uh, NDI in their SDK. They had a wrapper for .NET, and this was for the Windows .NET framework, Windows only version of .NET. I took that library, did some tweaks to it, so that it could wrap the NDI library on both Windows and Mac, and again, theoretically Linux, because it's all the same. All the libraries across all platforms have the same function calls, function names. That library that wraps that SDK, that's open source. So I actually released that on my GitHub, uh, github.com slash Elias Perunin. Should be able to find it. I think I call it NDI core lib or something like that. Anyway, that project is open source. So if you're, develop, if you're a software developer, you run on the .NET stack, you can go download that library and uh, consume NDI sources and do all your NDI magic right from .NET. 
So yeah, built on .NET, and then the graphics engine itself is built on uh, is built on Simple Direct Media Library two. Uh, Simple Direct SDL has been around forever. Like games in the '90s were written in SDL one, and it's been like it like the the libraries for it ship with the stream is uh, Steam Deck. Like it's 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 used in pretty much any game you can that isn't if it's not Unity and it's not Unreal Engine, it's probably SDL. And uh, been working with it forever and love it. Cool. We have another question in. Eduardo Augustine in Panama, PA writes in, what is the best approach to use proxies for live feed with NDI? Proxies are your preview feeds. That's when you want to use them. Uh, you do not want to use them for program unless you are okay with the resolution trade-offs. Again, the proxy feeds that are coming out from my two NDI uh, HX cameras, I think they're 320 by 240. Like I can bump them up to 640 by 480, but these are low res streams. You don't want to use these. Like if you're doing a full screen program feed, you don't want to use them for your full screen program feed. You know, if if you're if you just need to use them as little squares on your screen, they might be okay. Generally as well, the I have seen some devices where the proxy feeds are also running at a lower frame rate. So they might be just, you know, 640, 480 at 15 frames per second probably not usable, but as a preview, totally fine. As a preview, they're totally fine. Your proxies are your preview feed. What's the maximum number of uh, contribution feeds that you've got successfully working in your environment there? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, in my own environment, I've, you know, probably about 20 or 30 different feeds. I have talked with folks using that have tried out the multi-view and they're talking about like, we have a studio that has like 400 NDI feeds. Wow. Yeah. Like they have actual <laughs> studios that are just you know, like there's camera feeds, there's computer feeds, there's everything. There's, okay. you know, they're, they're using NDI to ship around their multi-view feeds. Like it's like some of the, like some of the companies that are, that are working with NDI are just, you know, they have the number of feeds are just mind boggling. That sounds like an NBC control room kind of circumstance where you're spending a lot of money on flat screens to be able to monitor things in real time. There and you know where it show it's in those particular cases where it's showing up is in corporate broadcast environments, corporate studios. So not necessarily, although there are some broadcasters that are starting to dip their toes in the water. I got a message from, um, I think it was and CNN did a press release on this one, so I could talk about it publicly. I think it was CNN, uh, CNN somewhere in Middle East. They have a whole control room that is uh, that's NDI. They have some SDI converters and whatnot mixed in, but it the the main and and actually bbc news also has been experimenting with ndi and trying to make what they call the newsroom of the future so we're, we're starting to see the, this technology get adopted by more and more larger broadcasters and it opens up a lot of options for if you're at the corporate level let's say fortune 500 you don't need to build a copper studio but you need to have a studio of some sort for live streaming or for corporate videos it opens up a lot of interesting options you mentioned 2110 as a potential uh, parallel thing. Do you think this is going to keep going out into the professional world or do you think there's challenges to it? I think, so I'm going to say something, the NDI folks might not like this. One of the reasons I started to make tools was I find that troubleshooting NDI can be opaque sometimes. And so part of the reason why I started to make the tools that I made was to help figure out, well, why is that source misbehaving? Like, can I put a number behind, you know, why I'm seeing this source sometimes desync or this source gives me drop frames? Like, is this a network problem? Is this a source problem? Is my computer not keeping up? The SDK exposes some of that, some of those metrics, for example, and I expose that in, in turn in the multi-view. You can, once you're tuned into a source, you can go in and see at the SDK level, you know, is the computer not keeping up with the is the computer not keeping up with decoding enough frames? Are we just, are we dropping frames from the source? Um, there's another tool that I made that will allow you to, it's a source browser tool, and it will allow you to capture a frame report. And in that frame report, it'll give you the timestamp that the frame was submitted, the timestamp the frame was received, and you can start to see the deltas between all of these to see is your, you know, are your frames being received on time according to the software? So I find that troubleshooting 
And I don't know that this is a challenge that's unique to NDI. I think this is a challenge that any video, any AV over IP solution is going to run into is the tools for troubleshooting this need to be better. We need to have more robust tools. I'm hoping to, you know, I'd, I'd like to add to that stack. But I think if we want to get beyond this, uh, this notion of, you know, any of these technologies suck because, you know, I, I tried it on my network and it didn't work. I, I want to put a number behind why it didn't work. Kind of like the, we, in the pre-show, we were, we were talking about the, uh, putting a number behind, you know, like a lower, why does the lower third feel not warm enough? I want to put a quantifiable number behind that. We need quantifiable numbers around like, well, why is this, like, why is this not meeting our needs? Is this a camera problem? Is it a network problem? Is it a computer problem? And it, and right now it does require some specialized knowledge to make work. I'm in a weird position where I'm this AV guy, but I'm also a software developer, but I'm also an IT guy. So I can dive in and do all this stuff. But, you know, there's a lot of folks who just aren't. They're not that combination of all those things. And I think we need to give those folks the tools they need to be successful with this tech, whether it's NDI, whether it's 2110, whether it's Dante, doesn't matter. Yeah, I think everybody's experience is nothing worse than troubleshooting when you don't have metrics of, of anything to know where it could be going wrong and you're just having to throw things against the wall and hope that something fixes it. That's never any fun. Let's go to the next question. James Brooks in New York writes in, do you find NDI wireless is a viable use or strictly hardware connection? Oh, man. It's, it's the goal. It's, it's a big promise to do NDI wireless. The reality is I've never, ever gotten it to work well. I've, I've never gotten it to work where I would rely on it in a production scenario. That said, I've done wireless once or twice on a production scenario where we could get away with it because the latency wasn't that big of an issue. The biggest issue we keep running into is the stability of the feeds is not great. And the latency is just shoots up and it, it just becomes unusable, it's, especially if you're doing any, any kind of voice, you know, talking head stuff, it, your video is just gonna, I've just found it desyncs. I think the promise is great. The delivery is, I, I don't know. I, I go wired all the time with NDI. I have not had great success with doing wireless NDI. Yeah, I, I've heard that from everybody I know in the engineering side. You never, you can never trust anything wireless as much as you can trust that piece of copper running between it. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael writes in, what experience have you had transporting NDI over VPN services like TailScale and Zero Tier? Okay, NDI over VPN. So this is an area I've been playing around with a lot. We, on a recent production, we were experimenting with doing NDI over Hamachi, which is a free VPN service you can use. The reason that we were doing that was it, Hamachi allows us to make what looks like one big uh, IP-based network. So we were able to ad address specific computers with IP addresses. We did this in combination with NDI Bridge, which NDI Bridge is an application that allows you to bridge two separate NDI networks. It all looks like one big uh, network. I found that for, while I wouldn't send, so there's a couple, there's a couple caveats here. It's great for control and preview. I found that doing NDI over VPN is great for control and preview scenarios. For actually ingesting the feeds, mixing them together and then sending them onwards, whether you're using VPN or whether you're using Bridge, the biggest issue you're going to run into is NDI is very sensitive to jitter and latency. If those frames arrive too late, NDI gets cranky. The recent versions of Bridge allow you to adjust the latency. It, it allows you to set up a buffer of up to five seconds. So you can trade off that latency for stability. But if you're going to be doing any kind of site-to-site -site bridging of your NDI networks, NDI wants a stable, a stable fast connection. And that pretty much goes down to fiber. We've had the best results, whether we do direct over uh, using NDI bridge and punching holes in firewalls, uh, fiber to fiber uh, site connections, that's given us the best results. VPN is fine for 
what I what I found is and uh, VPN is fine for control and preview. I wouldn't use it for live mixing. Cool. Next question. Eve Yuroff in Madison, Wisconsin writes in, how is the application controlled? I see documentation that says it's opening an HTTP service port 8901. I see a connection log, but when I direct a browser there, no web page rendered. Yeah, so there's two control surfaces that I've exposed on the multi-view. One is a basic web page controller. Right now that's accessible by going localhost port 8901 slash index.html. I'm going to try and fix that. I got that working like two days ago and wanted to push that out. Um, so that's one way to control the NDI. The other way, like you mentioned, on the website multiviewforndi.com, I have documentation for the HTTP API. And you should be able to just punch all those uh, different addresses into your web browser. They're implemented as HTTP GET. Uh, I know that there's going to be some software developers that will cry and say, no, thou shalt use POST for when you're sending data over to uh, something. But no, I'm implementing them as GET so that I can keep things simple. Um, I also, and and it allows, I've also, that also allows us to use the generic uh, HTTP handler for HTTP plugin for BitFocus Companion. And I've got a YouTube video or two up on my channel where I go in and actually do PTZ control using the multi-view uh, API plus uh, companion. So if you're not seeing that basic controller, localhost 8901 slash index.html, it'll take you there. Again, I published a video on my YouTube channel about that as, uh, as well. And I'm going to link to, I'm going to add those videos to the multi-view site, uh, hopefully later today. Cool. We'll make sure that we have the. We'll we'll stop here before we finish up and make sure that everybody has ways to contact you if they need to. Let's go to the next question for right now. John Wallace in Michigan writes in: Are you coming to us now via an NDI camera? Ah, am I coming to you now from an NDI camera today? No, I'm tweaking my whole setup, and I decided to go hardwired for this one. Um, but I do use NDI cameras a lot in my day to day setup. So, like when I'm doing different, like I was. When I released my book, I was doing a, a bunch of signings of it, and I had a bunch of NDI cameras set up to capture the overhead shots. Um, actually, my main, so the way I've tweaked my setup, I'm this is my first day using the Elgato prompter. I've got the Elgato prompter set up in front of me. I'm looking into the lovely eyes of Jason at the moment. And behind me is my main development setup and my, my main computer setup. Before I was doing all my content production from here, it was giving me an angle down, so it kind of looked like an interrogation video, and I wasn't happy with it. I couldn't, I, I couldn't do production and do my work from one computer. It was just way too much. So I've got my dedicated setup for doing, you know, podcasts, for doing live streams. All that stuff is here. My direct to camera take stuff with, you know, a nice L, with a nice background. You know, go RGB lighting makes everything better. But what I'm doing is after this is done, you'll see that I've got this blank arm here. I'm putting an NDI camera, one of my Logitech Mevos is going on that arm and that's going to be my day-to-day -day webcam. Because I don't want to, every time I do a Zoom call, if I had to spin around and face the prompter, that would get annoying fast. So I still need a webcam for day-to-day. -day. And I was thinking about it and I said, you know what, why don't I just do an NDI webcam? Like that would make the most sense. Alex, you had a question. So what do you think of the prompter? It's good. I would say I, I've got a, I recorded the whole setup process and the outtakes are going to be awesome because you're going to see Elias in pain stepping on things and <laughs> dropping lenses and it's great. Um, it's, it is a good all-in-one product as long as you're okay with its limitations. So it's only got a nine inch screen on it. I'm about two and a bit feet away from it, which is about the furthest away I'd want to be from it. Anything that's high contrast text, I can read no problem. But anything that's low contrast is, is unreadable. This is really meant to be on the other side of your desk. I've got four monitors set up here and it, it just does not fit into my current, it did not fit into my setup at all. So it's set up over here dedicated. Um, if I was, if I only had one or two monitors and this was on my desk, it would probably be perfect. That one to two feet away seems to be the nice sweet spot for it. So, and it is, it is, it, it's not what I would call a portable device either. It's uh, very much, 
it's a big bulky unit that does not collapse down. Uh, but very easy to set up, I will say. It takes about, once you've got everything all screwed together, it takes about maybe five, 10 minutes to get going. That's great. Let's go to the next question. Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana writes in, since Office Hours is a show about presentations and media in its forms, in its many forms, would you mind giving us an elevator pitch on North Star Slides? And did you consider those principles in being here today? Nice. The North Star Slides. Somebody has seen, I feel like somebody's seen some of my past content. I talk about this. The idea behind, I came up with this idea when I was at an academic conference because they they opened their conference by having this one slide that basically said, why are we here and what do we hope to accomplish by being here? In other words, what do we want to have at the very, once we're all done at the very end of today? I thought about it to an extent when I was work, when I was thinking about, you know, coming on the show today and saying, okay, well, we're going to talk about NDI. We're going to talk about multi-view. What do I want to leave people with? My, my punchline, my guiding star is in, in this in this talk is to say the NDI ecosystem is growing and it's not just like, and, and I can speak freely about this because I'm not affiliated with VizRT or NDI or any of those guys in any way. I'm just an independent guy. The NDI ecosystem is growing and the opportunities that it opens up for independent AV production companies um, is tremendous it's 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 incredible like the the kind of productions we've been able to put on using ndi technology like it's you know it, it's it's paying for my daughter my daughter's college fund like it's it, that that's the power of ndi here and i'm spending all this time you know making these tools because i see that it's it's a technology that if we get it right if we get it right, and we're on the path as, as an industry to getting it right, it is a technology that is going to open the doors for a lot of for a lot of folks to get into live event production without having to spend shed loads of money on crazy expensive gear. Like you can go, if you want to get started doing an, an NDI based video production and you've got $10,000 like I, 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 and I don't want to, you know, make assumptions about anybody's economic circumstances. These days, ten thousand dollars. I mean, that, you know, that's that's what three million Canadian or something. But ten for ten thousand dollars, the amount of gear that you can buy and be able to do live broadcast, live stream productions from a client site is unbelievable. And the fact that instead of having all these different expensive cables to lug around, you can run everything over a simple low cost ethernet cable. You can keep your cost, you can keep all the cost of production super low, but still deliver a high quality product for your clients. That's the kind of future that NDI provides. I think right now where we are is there are certain gaps that have been purposefully left in the ecosystem. NDI has kind of, I feel like the, the folks behind NDI have kind of said, here's the technology. Okay, everybody go play with it. And so all of us different vendors are filling in the gaps to what needs to exist that doesn't exist right now that will make life easy. So when it comes to, so my North Star is, when it comes to all of this stuff is, this is a, two, this is a technology that's only going to enable better productions, regardless of budget, you know, at, at a variety of levels. And if I can, if I can contribute my own abilities and software and my own abilities come through writing software, um, if I can contribute to that ecosystem through writing some good software and, you know, making things, e making the technology easier to use, then, you know, hopefully everybody wins. Let's go to the next question. Douglas Carmichael finishes out the hour with, are there plans to offer a perpetual license for your product? Mm, okay. Let's talk about licensing for a second because I've been, I waffle, I spent probably three weeks thinking about the licensing for this, for my multi-view. So the original prototype multi-view that I released, the Windows only version, I released that under a pay what you want model. And to everybody that did pay what they wanted for it, first off, thank you. That you know, that was product validation that made a difference. And I appreciate you. I use that. And that money, by the way, was all reinvested to get a, 
a uh, extended validation code signing certificate. It was used to fund getting the Apple developer account. It was used to, you know, it, I've I've been reinvesting. I took everything that I've made from all the tools that I've made so far. That has all been reinvested into this multi view, you know. So between all the certificates, all the developer accounts, like I'm probably in, you know, a few grand already. Like an EV certificate also takes a few weeks to do because they validate everything. An extended validation certificate bypasses all of the Microsoft Smart Screen stuff. So like you can when you when you download the NDI MultiView, my new NDI MultiView, it shows up as, you know, this is a, you know, this is a digitally signed, you know, everything is cool. It doesn't give you that yellow box of danger warning. Be careful. Don't install this. You know, it comes up as, hey, this is pretty cool. So I've, I thought probably for a good two or three weeks about how I want to license the software. And I've thought about perpetual licenses. One of the issues that I have that I've heard from other folks that make software that have had perpetual licenses is that unless they release a brand new version, like a big, like a 2.0 or a 3.0 release, they have a, they have a customer or they have a client that pays once for that software. They get to use it forever, which is great, but funding continual development and making sure that that product has life beyond that first year becomes a lot more challenging of a proposition. And a lot of the software, a lot of the independent vendors I've talked to, uh, like Andre Savick with uh, Videocom ZoomBridge and uh, Morton Stensland with uh, Presentation Tools. Like those, I, I talked a lot with those guys. They, they're much further down the road than I am with, with releasing their own products. And, you know, they have moved to those licensing models because they want their products to have life outside of just that first year when somebody buys it. Uh, they want to reinvest their, you know, the earnings into making the product better. And the reason why I went to a yearly license model is because I want to make sure that this product gets the updates, gets the attention, gets the resources that it needs to continue to grow and continue to evolve. Uh, so I do, it is released under a yearly license. There's a fully featured trial version available. You know, outputs a watermark, shuts down after 60 minutes, but every all the features are enabled. And I, I have made that decision to go with a, a yearly license model because I want this to be to be a product that you know lives on beyond year one. And I want to eventually dedicate resources, you know, I as much as I like programming, I would love to be able to, to, you know, turn some of the program, some of the coding responsibility over to somebody else. Cause like I do event production and this is the thing I do kind of on the side. So, uh, but I want to be able to justify throwing resources at this, uh, at this, uh, product. Elias, it's been fabulous to have you here. Um, contact information for people who want to get a hold of you either to explore your product or just to talk about the kind of things you've been talking about here today. And what's the best way for people to reach out to you? So if you are already on the Office Hours Discord, find me in there. You'll find me lurking around the Video Over IP channel all the time. Uh, if you're not on Office Hours Discord, you really should be. But if not, uh, you can. I'm active on Twitter at A-G-F-I-N-N, A-G-F-I-N. I'm active on LinkedIn as well. Search out Elias Perunin. Uh, you'll probably see me somewhere on there. The MultiView itself is available at multiviewforndi.com, multiviewforndi.com. So you can find it there. Uh, I got to add some more contact info to the website, but there's a bunch on there already. Uh, the easiest ways to get a hold of me are on uh, Twitter, the platform formerly known as Twitter, X, excuse me, and, <laughs> and the LinkedIn. Uh, I'm active on both platforms and, of course, Office Hours Discord. Awesome. So great to have you here today. Thank you for helping us uh, understand all of this new technology and things like that. Um, we are at Friday. As you know, we are kind of um, in a period where we're kind of casual, more casual as we've moved the servers and things like that. Alex, what's happening next week as we close up on this week? What do you got to what, what's coming up? Uh, yeah, so so um, I it's really hard because I don't. I wasn't ready for that question. I don't have. I don't have it in front of me. So what I can <laughs> I tell do. you is, is that the the two big things that that are that uh, that I know are, that we're working on right now is this breakdown on Tuesday that we will be talking about um, 
uh, we will be talking about the Apple event and really just breaking every little bit down to it. Um, so I think that it's really learning what what all the lights were and what what was it holding and how was it controlling it. Well, there'll be a discussion there. Uh, Tyler Stallman's going to join us, um, and uh, he's already done a breakdown of it on YouTube. And so we're going to have him on, and we're going to talk about it. But a bunch of us will be kind of just looking, trying to really peel out everything and, and squeeze. When you get a lot of behind the scenes, because Apple is promoting this, they there's a real opportunity for us to kind of squeeze all the juice out of that, you know, and so to make sure that we get everything out of that process. And so we're going to do that on Tuesday. On Wednesday, uh, we are going to be um, uh, having a lab with a Mixed Pre 3. A lot of us have Mixed Pre 3s, uh, you know, and uh, we're going to break down how we use them um, and uh, just show what kind of settings we're using and how we route and, and work on it and just answer questions. So a lot of these, again, we're going to be doing more and more of these labs and those are the ones that are top of my head because I wasn't ready for that question. That's all right. <laughs> so that that, that, yeah, that so helps me exactly. understand. Yeah, yeah, and I'm really looking forward to that because as, you know, the, the big news out of the Apple uh, presentation, out of the Scary Fast presentation, was they shot the whole thing on iPhones. I, as we said in the earlier in the in the hour, I really think that the, that the event was, a, was an ad for the iPhone and they used the the need for an event because they a lot of their hardware stuff gets upgraded without a lot of pomp and circumstance um and so i think that they use the event to promote the fact that the iphone could do that uh, i do not expect them to do it for every event um, i think that although it does feel like you should do an iphone event shot with an iphone i mean like i think that now that you yeah. have the quality there it feels dog like you know, a little bit say. of dog fooding there so or <laughs> yeah. fish fooding depending on what company you're working for and um and so i think that there is is some some merit to that but i don't know if they'll they'll do that they might they might be a lot of times you know you see apple kind of slowly sneak up on something so they kind of tested the water with that one. We'll know whether they're planning. The next one will tell us. Like if they say this was all shot on an iPhone, most likely, like because this is the least important, the last one that happened a week and a half ago was the least important one to them, the iPhone being the most important, and that gives them a runway of three or four events to kind of pick up speed. So it'll be interesting to see if they actually move away from Aerie and towards the iPhone. So we'll see. Ooh, that'll be interesting. All right. Uh, as always, tomorrow um, uh, is more two hours of just general Q&A, and then Sunday is the non-broadcast version of the show. So if you want to come in and ask Alex things about what's going on in the back end, that's your perfect opportunity on, uh, on Sunday. Thank you all for being here. For everybody who makes this show possible every day, we appreciate everybody, uh, specifically all of our producers, those of you who put questions into the show. The show does not run with Without your questions and so we appreciate you every day as you make this possible for us um, the incredible panelists who always show up every day here and and answer your questions we appreciate all of them and without any diminishing of importance because they're critical to this operation our entire backstage and in the cloud crew from all over the world who assembles every day to put this show on you people are amazing and you astonish me every day it's a privilege to be able to talk to you and slip into the back end as we're getting ready for the show by the way alex has uh, another set of things coming up where if you want to be interested if you want to be part of the show if you want to be a panelist or something like that there are ongoing opportunities to explore that so we highly suggest that if you are interested in that, come on, join the panel. Great bunch of people, and you'll enjoy it. All right, that takes care of today. We have traveled in the Tlaloc Traversal 92,324 miles. That's 148,582 kilometers. That's more than 731 million of these guys. It's a banana for scale, and we appreciate your being here. We will see you tomorrow. I'd like to thank Twitter for messing with absolutely every rundown at the end of every single show. So I, I have to say the, Z, the ZVE1, um, we're going to do one Did more you crash? test. It, it, it keeps on turning off. I've had it now for two days. It's turned off like four times. Oh, um, no. And so it, and I, you know, the room is pretty cold. Like I'm not sure exactly, like it's overheating somehow. Um, so that's what happened in the beginning of the show there. I, it had always gotten through the show before. I don't know what happened there. But it has, it's been, I, I was like, I know I can get through the show and then I'm probably going to switch back to the other camera. And I had to do it during the show instead. <laughs> Elias, <laughs> so, thank so you for anyway, being such a great yeah. guest because yeah, yeah, <laughs> I wasn't so quite was, prepared was for this we, we were, yeah, so Yes, thank you for the good. fire Elias, drill to uh, Alex's yeah. camera. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. That's what happens when we test new cameras. We're gonna, I'm going to put a dummy battery in and I'm